Happy birthday, America. We got to talk about Monday Night Raw from July 4th, 2022. All right. Um, we're going to do some news and notes before we get to the show. Uh, first note, Ric Flair is back in the WWE signature. The woo is back. And he's very excited about it. He um, he tweeted out that he feels like he got his dignity back. Yeah, one of the most hurtful things in his career was being uh, stripped from history, so he felt like he got his spot back. So he's very excited. Um, I guess this is part of WWE's new deal with Ric Flair. They're supposed to be doing some kind of... I think it's another documentary they're doing on Ric Flair. I mean, how many documentaries do they really need on Ric Flair? But I think they got another one coming. But they put the woo back. Flair's excited. Uh, I was kind of like, okay. You know, it, it, it did the thing. I know he was very hurt when it initially happened. So glad it's all cleared up and he can actually uh, feel better about himself. Ric Flair back in the good graces of the Fed. All right. Okay, so next thing. Uh, Shotzi. Shotzi received a lot of criticism. I would say just for SmackDown, but it'd be a stale news by that point. Shotzi got a lot of criticism for her performance at Money in the Bank. A lot of people were very angry with her. Um, botching spots. Some people even said she tried to, she damn near killed Alexa Bliss, which I actually forgot about because she had Alexa Bliss on her shoulders once and she just kind of lost control and fell backwards. And uh, Alexa Bliss hit the ladder and, you know, it was kind of ugly. But Alexa Bliss wasn't hurt. Um, so uh, what we had was Shotzi went into the notes app, which, you know, is always a bad sign. And instead of just, you know, taking it on the chin, she decided to go out there and tweet out this message that I'm going to read to you. Uh, it's, it's, it's a bit much. It's a, as one of my favorite YouTubers said, it's a lot of a lot. So she says, quote, there are three things I care about at the end of a match. Is everyone safe? Did everyone have fun? Did the crowd react? Nobody got hurt. We all had a blast and the Vegas crowd was hot, hot, hot. I felt on top of the world after that match and was so excited to finally have my first hardcore match in over a year. I wouldn't have done anything I didn't practice or thought I couldn't do safely. But I'm not a Russell robot. I'm a human and slips happen, especially in a chaotic, unpredictable ladder match. I could take a joke and laugh at myself. One of the first things I said was I can't wait to see that spot on Botchamania. But comments like you should be fired and other terrible things admittedly hit hard. I have to... I had to have a few friends wipe the tears off my face and slap some sense into me and remind me who the F I am. That being said, all my haters can suck my big, giant, hairy mangoes. And I have no idea what that means. Now, there's a lot of stuff in here that I don't like. You know, uh, for starters, I don't even like that she's even in the notes app doing it. You don't need to respond to everybody. It was a bad performance. Just take the L, get better, move on. But I understand we're in a business where kayfabe is dead. But saying, oh, I wouldn't have done anything I didn't practice first. It's like, oh, come on. Come on. Oh, I, I did it perfectly in rehearsal. Come on. You know, nobody. Oh, don't. <laughs> don't do that. Okay. Don't, don't do that. It's supposed to be a fight. You know, if you you could just say, hey, things don't work out the way you, you thought they would. So that was the weird thing. Second thing, I had a, a couple of friends wipe tears off my face. So that means you were hurt by what you saw on the Twitter machine. So you let people know that you've gotten to. You're selling, basically. Mistake. It's a mistake. Because now people know exactly that you're reading their garbage and you're going to respond to it. And your response is going to be going to sit in a corner and cry. There's already the whole sympathy card because that's exactly what happened. She put this garbage out there and everybody's like, oh, Shotzi, I love you. I love you so much, Shotzi. You're so awesome. Even Alexa Bliss, who damn near broke her neck in that match, was like, Oh, Shotzi, I like you so much. You're so talented. I'm like, oh, come the fuck on. Come on. What the hell? No, 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 no. What is going on here? 
Stop doing this. Stop it. Stop doing it. No, it sucks. Look, I I, I like Shotzi. I really do. Um, and I was even I even said, hey, this was her kind of match. This thing should have worked out for us. The kind of stuff she did on the Independence all the time, but it didn't work out this time. She looked awful. And what she should have said was, start. She shouldn't have said anything. But anything she should have said should have come from a position of some version of strength where she could say, hey, it's okay. You know, hey, it happens. You know, bad nights happen and things don't go your way. Whatever. If you had to respond, just say things didn't go my way today. You know, I had a rough night at the office. Telling people that you sat in a corner or something crying and your friends had to wipe tears from your eyes. Like, come on. And then, of course, the defiance at the end sucked my big hairy mango. So I'm like, what the fuck does that even mean? Like, that's... Is that problematic language? Is that sexual harassment? That's what I want to know. Because does she literally mean fruit? Or does she mean, like, titties? She can't possibly mean testicles. I, I don't. I don't know. I'm not. I don't. Haven't quite figured it out. And for Christ's sake, don't say a match that's supposed to be dangerous was. It was really fun. We all had a blast. It's not a sleepover. Okay, it was a ladder match. We're supposed to think that this death defying and scary. And you guys were like, you know, like you were in a fucking playpen or something. What's going on here? Like, why are these wrestlers so dumb? Why do they do this? Why are you acting like that? Why, why, why are you acting like this not dangerous business, man? What's wrong with Shotzi? What's wrong with everybody who read this and was like, instantly not like, Shotzi, uh, delete this, please. Delete it, please. You like a fool. All right, third note. Uh, Big E is, was talking about his neck. Uh, and this was an interesting tweet because it's an update on his uh, neck issues. It says, quote, my C1 isn't ossifying, forming bone quite yet. The current plan is to get more scans at the one-year mark and see how it's progressing. The great news is I feel tremendous and surgery is off the table. So it's looking like he's going to be out at least until March 2023. So he's talking about it being a full year before he can even get scans to see what's going on with his neck. So the likelihood of him wrestling before the end. Now, a neck injury is a little bit more serious. Could he possibly be kayfabing and he pops up, you know, at some point soon? Well, it's entirely possible. Anything is oh, anything is possible, you know. But the likelihood of that, I, I don't know. I don't know. You know, and uh, they're going to want to give him the hero's return, the hero's welcome. But what does that look like? What does that mean in March of 2023? Because at least by that time, we should be in WrestleMania season. So, a guy who coming back from a serious neck injury, especially if you think he's a top guy, he should get a top spot. But, there's only one champion right now. And you got two guys who are seriously injured. One of them will probably be back before his full uh, nine-month recovery. Talking about Cody here. And he's probably was the one earmarked for the title anyway. And now you got Big E who was kind of like, it would be a triumphant return for him to be able to come back from a serious neck injury and become the WWE champion again, uh, which is a great story. You got two great stories here. So what WWE could do is they could just let Big E sit, sit out maybe a year and a half. Maybe don't, even if he's perfectly healthy, don't let him come back in March. Maybe push it back to August or maybe September. You know, let Cody breathe with the title for a while. Let people get sick of it. And then you reintroduce Big E as an opportunity to either turn Cody heel or as an opportunity to take the title off Cody and put it on Big E. One or the other. But I don't see any reason why we should. Uh, and I know some people are going to say, well, Big E shouldn't be in the main event anyway. Yada, yada, yada. I get that, you know, but. You know, and, and to, to a degree, you may say he was not a top guy because they just put him right back in New Day afterwards. But 
I think the fan reaction is going to warrant him being pushed back into the main event spot. But I'm glad he's okay. He doesn't need his uh, he doesn't need the neck brace. He doesn't have to have surgery. So he's living his life, man. Hopefully, you know he can get back to work at least as far as working out is concerned and feel bad, feel good. You know, hopefully he doesn't have any setbacks, and um, we'll see what's going on with, with all this wrestling stuff. But at least glad the homeboy's not in a wheelchair because that that broken neck was pretty bad. All right. Let's finally get back to the show. All right. So, Lashley welcomed us to Raw and uh, said that there's not a man in any division, in any company, which got a ooh chant, um, role reaction, that can take that United States title from him. Uh, Theory interrupted. Says that, you know, uh, everybody wants to hear from him because he's Mr. Money in the Bank. And they like LeBron James and Tom Brady. He came through in the clutch. Then announced that he was going to get a rematch for the United States title at SummerSlam. Then uh, they had some more words between the two of them. Uh, Theory tried to hit uh, Lashley with the... Well, he threw it to him so that he'll, he'll catch it. He sucker punched him. Then he hit him. He bludgeoned him a couple of times with the briefcase. Lashley, of course, is the almighty. Kind of powered through that. Then uh, Theory fled and ran away. Now, with the announcement that Theory is going to be wrestling Lashley at SummerSlam, some people are just starting to ask the question, but we was promised Theory versus John Cena. It's like, well, were you? Because I don't remember WWE saying anything about that. I remember the dirt sheet saying something about it. And that was kind of it. Now, I did see that they may have some issues with getting Cena back in the ring. Uh... I heard that there's some some third party issues. I think somebody said insurance or something to that effect. There's some weird stuff going on, and that maybe he was supposed to wrestle at this show, and plans changed. Who knows? But it was never officially uh, brought to bear by WWE that John Cena was wrestling theory. You know, this is what the dirt she said was going to happen, and you know what happens when the dirt she says something and then it doesn't happen. His plans changed. So did plans ever change? See, there was this question that had been floating around. When did they decide to put the money in the bank on theory? And then there's some people saying, well, it was always the plan. And some people say, oh, it was a last minute decision. It was hot shotted or whatever the case may be. The bottom line is nobody knows. It's just nobody knows, man. Nobody knows. <laughs> it's, it's, it's okay to not know. It's fine to not know. You know, we don't have to have every question answered all the time, you know, and we don't we don't need like the official story every time a thing happens and people are kind of surprised by it. Sometimes just let things sit, you know, it's all right to not know when they decide to make theory uh, wrestle for the money in the bank. We, we don't know. We don't care. The thing is, it's an odd thing that people will be surprised by it. Considering when Vince is really, I guess you could say, in love with a guy, like he really sees top guy potential, he does stuff like he did with Theory. Like he did it with Edge once. He had Edge lose early in the night. I think he lost the title, and then he took Kofi's spot and won the Elimination Chamber and won a different title. You know, it was kind of like, oh, okay, that's bullshit. You know? And nobody was ever like, when did Vince decide to put Edge in this Money in the Bank ladder match? It's kind of like, oh, well... It is what it is, you know, <laughs> you know, it's Vince doing his thing. He's showing favoritism. At least this time it's in storyline. And thus it makes a lot of sense because we know that he's aligned with Vince. So he's going to get extra opportunities. We get that. But I think so many people had kind of made up their mind that it was going to be Theory and Cena. And then they did the promo segment to tease it even more to let people to believe that the, that it was true, that it was going to happen. Now, I don't know if it's going to happen or not. Um, I'm not entirely sure. Did I even want to see Theory versus John Cena right now? Theory needs more momentum, you know? I know making him Mr. Money in the Bank is a big push, but they typically knock you down a peg. Once you win the Money in the Bank, you start losing a lot. You start getting knocked down and kicked around and everything, and 
it's the shits, but they, for some reason, enjoy doing that. It's the dumbest shit in the world. You know, it's just so stupid. We're going to give you this huge push, but first we got to, we got to, you know, you got to eat crow for like eight months. And it's like, what? Like, what the fuck was the point of you? Whatever. All right. So, um, theory versus Cena is not happening at SummerSlam. It will be Cena and Lashley. I mean, or the- theory and Lashley. So now people are, are fantasy booking John Cena to wrestle other people. And I'm like, I'm not sure John Cena will even be there. It's three weeks from now. All right. Three weeks. If Cena isn't on this episode of SmackDown or something, or next week's episode of Raw, he probably ain't going to make it. All right. Uh, maybe they, maybe they will say to themselves, maybe it's going to be on Saudi Arabia. You know, maybe Cena will wrestle in Saudi Arabia. Maybe Cena will wrestle in Clash at the Castle. Maybe that's a better usage of Cena. Maybe they decided, you know what? The Clash at the Castle tickets ain't moving like we want them to. Instead of giving you Cena at SummerSlam, we already given you Brock and we already given you Roman. Maybe we need to save Cena for Clash at the Castle where, you know, ticket sales might be a little soft. Maybe they want to save it for Saudi Arabia. Where, you know, they get a, a huge paycheck out of the deal. Or was it $50 million per run that they do in Saudi Arabia? This could be any other thing that could have popped up. Now people are saying, oh, well, it's not gonna, if it's not going to happen at SummerSlam, it might happen at WrestleMania. I'm like, God damn. We went from SummerSlam to WrestleMania? Like, you know that there's a couple of big shows in between that time, right? There's a couple of big shows where they could use Cena. Um, if they got them free... I say save it for Clash of the Castle. That's what I would do. I would do Cena Theory at Clash of the Castle if the, if, if it's going to get done at all. Do it there. There's no reason why you shouldn't do it. You know. All right, let's get back to Raw because we got cookout segments that lead into this six man tag. It's a cookout by the Street Profits are hosting a cookout, and every mid card weirdo is there. Riddle, Shelton Benjamin, Veer, the Alpha Academy. Hell, we, we even get Seth Rollins in it l- later. Uh, but the, the Street Profits in their cookout, it's interrupted by the Alpha, Alpha Academy, who said that they they shouldn't be partying because they lost last week at, to the Usos. Whether they dispute the finish or not, they still lost. So what are they doing out here having fun? Which is a good point. You know, the Street Profits always take losses and complete and total. I mean, it's WWE baby faces in general. You know, you're supposed to be like a bulletproof baby face. You know, you lose a hundred times in a row. You still come out smiling and grinning and somebody kicked your shit in. And you still come out smiling and grinning. It just doesn't make any sense. It's ridiculous. But so Chad Gable made a good point here. He said he wanted to give them a history lesson and read the De- Declaration of Independence. Um, Otis said that Gable was a true American because he was an Olympian. Uh, Dawkins said that Montez Ford was a true American because he was a Marine. And I was like, okay, this is, all of this is pretty good. It's a good point. Why can't we feud over this? This should be the argument, not, you know, then they start talking about who can eat more hot dogs, Otis or Dawkins. I was like, oh God, hot dog eating contest. Good God. What the fuck? I I understand these holidays, this holiday themed episode is supposed to be fun, but, um, I don't understand what the hell is supposed to be fun about, you know, this shit. Anyway, I actually like the argument that, you know, they both served their country, but in different ways. You know, Chad Gable didn't put his literal life on the line, but he trained his entire life for that role and for that spot, you know? So that kind of, it's a, it's a good question. You know, obviously I wouldn't put an athlete on the same level as a, as a soldier, but who's to say what's a bigger risk? You know, I mean, some people getting going into the military, you dedicate more time to your country by training and working hard in sports than you do in the military. But it's higher standards to be in the military. It's far more dangerous. You know, it's danger being involved in something more dangerous, a good barometer. So, I thought I think this thought it was an interesting idea. Um, so we ended up getting the the food eating contest, the hot dog eating contest later on. Uh, after this, we get um, 
Tozawa ate 48 hot dogs to win the hot dog eating contest. Otis only ate 23 and Dawkins ate 22. Otis didn't feel too good afterwards and Gable was screaming about a recount. It was absolutely absurd. It was ridiculous. Okay. Um, at this point, when Otis started complaining about his stomach, I was like, we about to get a vomit spot. And of course, that's what the fuck we got because these people are ri- ridiculous and they have juvenile senses of humor. Lashley and the Street Profits defeated Theory and the Alpha Academy. Uh, Dawkins hockey checked Theory. I mean, he just blocked him right out of his skin. It was great. You know, <laughs> it was so similar to what Keith Lee really got over doing in, on, in uh, NXT. Bashing glass against the, bashing guys against the glass. Back when the glass was up during, th- I guess, not NXT Thunderdome. They didn't have a Thunderdome. Uh, when they had a light audience, let's put it like that. An uh, intimate audience. Like that, we need to integrate that into Dawkins' game a lot more often. That shoulder tackle, that shit looked good. And Theory sold it very well. Uh, Otis got speared in the stomach. He also got frog splashed, even though he didn't get pinned. Gable got pinned um, by Lashley Spear. After the match, of course, Otis projectile vomited as Gable started screaming, what happened to his, who did this to his top guy? Who did this to him? Who did this to you? It was like maybe sitting down, pigging out on processed hot dog meat. You know, it's not the best thing in the world, but it's gross. It's silly. Uh, it's it's that Nickelodeon horse shit that they like to do. Where there's always somebody farting or throwing up and none of it's serious. It's all childish and buffoon level stuff. Um, Somebody, <laughs> I'm pretty sure it was a dirt sheet, said, remember when Otis was Mr. Money in the bank? I'm like, yeah, I do. And I remember people complaining about that too. You know, like the weird thing about Otis is it wasn't until right here that he actually started looking stupid. You know, like Otis is a, is a naturally stupid character and that's it's him being dim witted is still a major part of his character. But as far as like jobbing Otis out and stuff like that, they've really been reserved on that. They really haven't beat Otis a lot. You know, like he's lost matches like he lost this match. But he wasn't the one that got beat. You know, he wasn't the one that got pinned. He wasn't the one that submitted in the in the handicap match or anything like that. So they're protecting Otis for something. Maybe they say, hey, giving him the money in the bank was a mistake. Or maybe they gave it to him for sympathy purposes. So they, you know, um, maybe as a catalyst to turn him heel. Or maybe there were some other types of aborted plans. We don't know. But clearly, they're taking care of Otis. And... It's a weird thing to see because it wasn't until he did this up chuck shit that I was kind of like, I don't like, mm-mm. it's been a while since Otis even said more than a paragraph in, in a promo or something like that. Normally he just kind of stands there and go, yeah, and that was about it. But, uh, this was awful. This was awful. The, the, the six man tag was fine. You know, the six man tag was great. Um, uh, Gable was incredible. You know, he matched up with Lashley very well. You know, it's hell to a degree. I wish it was Lashley and Gable, you know, and Gable was treated as a serious contender. But unfortunately, that's not the case. It is not the case. Um, in any event, it's perfectly fine. I don't know. Theory has already lost the match. has been carrying the money in the bank briefcase. So there we go. Uh, to continue with the cookout theme, though, we got... Uh, it was another cookout scene in which Omas is being talked to MVP. There's some 24 seven shenanigans in which Reggie bumps into Omas. He ends up getting thrown. Uh, Mustafa Ali and Cedric Alexander decide to steal Veer's food for reasons unknown. They're just doing shit because they're not doing anything else. So we're just going to pick on Veer and steal his macaroni and cheese. Like, come on. Surely we can do something better with these guys than have them swipe Veer's plate, right? So what? He can beat him up next week for stealing his food? For starters, that's not even something baby faces would do. Why would a baby face take the heel's food? Why would you do that? Like, that doesn't even make any sense. Why would you even do that? 
I don't know, man. <laughs> I don't know. Like, bruh, like, what the fuck? It's, it would be one thing if you're, like, for starters, why is babyfaces and heels even at this party together? You know, like, it's already weird on that, in that regard. You have babyfaces and heels just hanging out together, going to a barbecue, eating. It's like, why is this shit so painfully normal? Like, you've never seen, like, the Cobra Commander and G.I. Joe going to the cookout together because it's the holidays. And we could put the past behind us. It's the holidays. What the fuck are you... T- no! This ain't the spirit of Christmas. Why are the baby faces and the heels even hanging out together? If anything, it should have been the heels weren't invited and then they came to show up and shut it down or interfered and started some shit. If anything, that's what it should have been. You know? That'd have been something like something out of like a Charlie Brown cartoon or something like that, but it's the best way to do it. Instead of having Veer in his wrestling gear, sitting down as Mustafa Ali and Cedric Alexander look like they just came from the beach. I'm like, what the? F- Why are some people in their wrestling gear and other people aren't? <laughs> what, what is going on? Like, it's it's so ridiculous. These silly holiday episodes do nothing but confuse the hell out of everybody. Anyway, anyway. Uh, Ezekiel was talking to the Street Prophets and he got a little careless with his ketchup and he sprayed it all over Seth Rollins. Uh, Seth Rollins tried to laugh it off but was still very upset, very angry. Which led to the Ezekiel-Seth Rollins match, which I don't think we needed, but I'm glad we got because this actually was not bad. This was a great showcase for Ezekiel. He got to bench press Seth Rollins a few times. He looked really good in the match. He nailed some, some big moves. Uh, Ezekiel's quite plain, even though the guy playing him is very charismatic. We need to get a personality on Ezekiel, a persona, outside of Amalias' brother. He needs to be Amalias' brother and I do this, you know, or something. Because he's still just coming out as Ezekiel, and he looks like a creative character. You know, he needs a persona, a personality, uh, something. I don't know. But Seth Rollins wins the match. Um, perfectly fine with this match. And then Rollins decided he was going to punish Ezekiel by continuing to, to kick his ass. This led Riddle and Swimming Trunks showed up and gave him an RKO. So it looked like we we're going to have Riddle and Seth Rollins at SummerSlam. And you know what? I'm okay with that. I am not angry at that. Um, Riddle continues his march forward. You know, it's not quite Ro- Roman Reigns, but it's a step up from the Usos. You know, he's falling backwards <laughs> you know he's falling backwards into a bigger match because he hasn't done anything to warrant wrestling seth rollins and i'm not even really sure what this beef with him and seth rollins is all about but i guess we'll figure it out when we get there but i'm okay with rollins versus uh riddle i'm okay with that i actually like it all right now we gotta go way back to the beginning of the show again because mysterios are are next um Ray says that, well, Dominic says that the, the Judgment Day were disgraceful for what they said about him and Ray. Um, and say he, there's nobody better for him to learn from. And Ray says that he and his son are the only father and son tag team champions in WWE history. So he must be doing something right. So they put over uh, wrestling in San Diego. This is. Dominic's first ever match in San Diego, his dad's hometown. And uh, you think they're going to go out there and WWE is going to do the babyface job, you know, hometown job. They do it every week or pretty much every week. They do it whenever they possibly can. So I was looking for, I was looking for it. <laughs> I was looking for it. So Judgment Day versus the Mysterios. Uh, this match was really fun. Uh, Finn Balor has abandoned the trunks for long tights. He started putting a purple towel in his pocket. You know, the aggression is there. He's he's far more charismatic as a heel than he is as a baby face. I actually like him as a heel now. This is just the first time he's really gotten an opportunity to do it. Now, promo, you'll have to see, but this is his first, you know, uh, foray into wrestling a match as a heel. Him and Damian Priest looked really good as a tag team. Of course, the Mysterios were pretty good, except Dominic, who is, you know, Dominic is Dominic. Uh, <laughs> so the the big finish was a great finish. The <laughs> Finn Balor gets a chair. He hits Dominic with the chair. 
And he looks like he's going to hit Ray with the chair. Ray flops. And Cell's getting hit with the chair even though he hasn't been hit yet. The referee turns around, sees Finn Balor with the, with the chair, immediately disqualifies Finn Balor. So it was kind of a, a Eddie Guerrero finish. Great finish. Crowd went ape. Crowd was really, really excited that the Mysterios won by disqualification. Great finish. This was an excellent finish. I enjoyed this. And it opened up the door for more matches. Uh, I enjoyed these four working together. You know, uh, hopefully Dominic will get better soon. And I, it's not that he's sick. It's just that he's not great. <laughs> you know, so he needs to get better soon. He needs to get well soon. All right. And by get well, I mean good. You know, he needs to get to a passable level. But uh, Ray was inspired in the, on this night. And I was really enjoying seeing Finn Balor and Damian Priest work heel. This has been great. Um, I'm wondering what's going on with the, with the Judgment Day. Uh, how long are we going to do this thing with the Mysterios before Edge returns? Because it seems like that's what the, who it is in the vignettes is going to be Edge. And he's going to want revenge. But which guy is he going to wrestle? And so... In the comment section, let me know which guy would you prefer him wrestle. I know that you know I've heard on the dirt sheets that he really wants to wrestle Finn Balor, and that's more than likely to be the opponent because he's the higher of I guess the higher value of the two since Finn Balor has actually made him in pay per views while you know he Damian Priest hasn't. So, um, but I'm I'm okay with this, you know. Uh, but they're embroiled right now with the with the Mysterios. So the question has to be how we're going to get out of this whole thing with them and the Mysterios. So after the the match, uh, Judgment Day was pissed. They attacked the Mysterios backstage, of course, to set up the rematch. Uh, Damian Priest said some stuff in Spanish about it not being his house or his Pueblo. And um, I think he said this is our house. I think that's what he said in Spanish. But I, I am enjoying the Judgment Day when they allow them to do stuff. They're just not giving them a lot of stuff to do. And uh, that's unfortunate, you know, but it's WWE. What can you do? You can scream and shout and yell about, you know, more opportunities for more people and all that kind of stuff. But WWE is going WWE, man. You know, you should be highlighting guys like Finn Balor and, and the Rey Mysterio because you don't have a lot of time left with them. They're in their 40s, man. What What more can they really provide at this point? You know, you got to dig in there and try to get everything you can out of these guys. But WWE just insists that they're middle TV wrestlers. And it's ridiculous. You know, these guys could be working main events if you let them. All right. Miz. Miz is proud of Logan Paul. Said that Logan Paul's style is to get headlines. And that's really what got him the position he is on social media. And he says, but he's going to learn very quickly that getting attention outside the WWE doesn't mean anything inside the WWE. And he had to learn the hard way because he also came from the outside. He came from the real world and he's going to have to, he's been trying to teach Logan Paul what proper etiquette and how to survive in the WWE. So he's going to give him one opportunity to retract his statement that Logan Paul made about coming after Miz and if and tag team up with him and become the tag team champions. Because if he doesn't, Miz is going to humble Logan Paul. And I, I like the angle of uh, Logan Paul is the new Miz in terms of he's a guy who came from outside of wrestling into wrestling and people think he has no passion for it. People don't believe he's any good at it, even though a lot of people say that he's very athletic. And I think I'm, mostly most people actually gave a positive review of his match at WrestleMania. Uh, but you still have those holdouts, those hardest of the hardcores, the, fan, the people who are fans of like Allen Five Angels and shit. Those people who have no faith that, you know, uh, he's just a celebrity and all this kind of stuff, which, you know, he is what he is. I'm not going to say that he's not, but I say that he has to have some kind of passion for it if he keeps wanting to do it. But we're looking at this position where, you know, the Miz is kind of looking at Logan Paul saying, like, you're a younger version than me, you know. So Miz is going to be the locker room leader, the veteran. It's kind of going to haze. Logan Paul. 
which is very odd. He's putting himself in the Benoit position because Benoit is the guy who kicked me out of the locker room. Interestingly enough, Benoit was an undersized guy who was ripped to shreds, and we see from Miz uh, in his match with AJ Styles that he's going to partner up with an undersized guy, <laughs> undersized veteran who's ripped to shreds. All right, let's get to that match. Uh, Miz versus AJ Styles. AJ Styles has just been floating around WWE for the last two years. In and out of stuff. Not really involved. Vaguely losing. Vaguely winning. Not really going anywhere. Just kind of spinning his wheels. It's It's been quite sad, honestly. Because we could, he's just like Ray and Balor. We could be doing more with these guys. I know he's 40, but if you're going to have the fucking guy on the roster, we could be doing more with him. Um... AJ Styles wins the match. Uh, after the match, Ciampa attacks AJ Styles. Um, he's it like he's about to run his knee into his forehead or something like that. And Styles fought back. Miz attacked him from behind. Uh, Miz and Ciampa actually shake hands uh, after the skull crushing finale to AJ Styles. So it seems like Ciampa is going to be Miz's attack dog. And maybe... He's going to be his bodyguard or his his head. I don't want to say his head because I think the Miz is even bigger than Ciampa. But it seems like they're going to do with Ciampa the same thing they did with Pete Dunne. Where he's just going to be like this small but very highly agitated and fierce guy. And that's going to be his role. Um, I'm okay with it. Ciampa as this silent assassin. You know, who, you know, there's, you don't know what he's thinking, but you've seen him pop up and help Miz enough where you can tell that he kind of wants to be under the Miz umbrella. So I, I actually love the Miz and Ciampa as a partnership because they at least get Ciampa on TV, which is what we need. We need Ciampa on TV and more opportunities to show what he can do and to blossom. Miz is on TV every week, rain or shine, thunderstorm or hurricane. The Miz is on TV. So if Ciampa is going to work with Miz, nine times out of ten, he's going to be on TV more, which is a good thing. That's what we all want. If that means he's got to be, he's got to play second fiddle to the Miz for a little while, I'm okay with that. Because, you know, you build up to the breakup, apparently. You know, even though they're doing that kind of right now with Logan Paul, putting an, another guy in the way for Logan Paul to have to deal with, and it's somebody who's a lot more, ferocious and a lot more physically intimidating and a lot more of a threat than the Miz. It's, it's actually pretty good. It's good business, you know? So essentially what we're telling everybody is Logan Paul is not going to get no fair match with the Miz. Cause it's always going to be, you know, Ciampa outside the ring or lurking in the shadows to come out, and take his head off. And I'm okay with that. I'm 100% cool with that. So, <clears throat> I like the angle that we're going here with Miz and Logan Paul, you know, with Miz is sort of uh, finding himself in a different position, trying to help a young guy stay, stay the course and teach him how to make it in WWE. All right. We get Liv Morgan's first promo. We don't save it for SmackDown because why would we do that? Why would we save the SmackDown Women's Champions first address or first entrance. Why would we save it for the show she's champion of? We got to do it on Raw. And uh, it was a nothing burger. It was a typical baby face promo. You know, they, the fans chanted, you deserve it for a couple of seconds. Liv Morgan said, dreams come true. And that the fans believed in her, even when she didn't believe in herself, the fans gave her confidence to keep going forward. It was syrupy sweet. A syrupy sweet moment that actually started to die down almost immediately. It's like everybody was very excited when her music played and everybody was excited when she came to the ring and then she just kept cutting this my dream, my dream, my dream promo and people are like, okay, you're the champion now. Like, okay, you're the champion now. Let's see something else. Let's do something else. Let's take it to the next level. So Natalia comes out there and she wanted credit for the success of Liv Morgan because she's the one who destroyed Ronda Rousey's knee with the sharpshooter. And she wants a SmackDown Women's title match. Um, Liv Morgan says, well, since we're going to be sharing a locker room now, you know, uh, you know where to find me. And it's like, well, she's already found you. You, you heard you in the goddamn ring with her. 
Carmella comes down there and says what everybody's thinking, that they need to take this SmackDown business back to SmackDown because Carmella wants to fight Bianca Belair. And uh, Liv Morgan said, why don't you make me? And then Carmella was like, uh, maybe we will. And Natalia was like, we? And she was like, we? And then they decided to beat up Liv. And they pummeled Liv for a good 30 to 40 seconds before Bianca Belair ran to the ring to make the save. Of course, Adam Pearce makes it a tag team match. Bianca and Liv versus Natty and Carmella. And Bianca and Liv win. Match was solid, I guess. Uh, the finish came with the Oblivion on Natty. So, um, hopefully Natty isn't going to be the first opponent for Liv Morgan. Hopefully we're, we're done with this right here. It, it feels like it's done. As far as I'm concerned, it's done. <laughs> as far as I'm concerned, it's finished. All right? Uh, okay, so uh, R-Truth came out dressed as Uncle Sam. So R-Truth is Santa Claus. He's Uncle Sam. He's the Easter Bunny. He's everything. So that should be said because there was certain people who were upset about this. So R-Truth came out as Uncle Sam, and he did a bit about Independence Day. But, of course, in typical R-Truth fashion, he was confused about what was Independence Day. He thought it was the movie. So he's talking about Vivica Fox and Will Smith, and he's talking about the cast of Independence Day, the movie. He gets interrupted by Gunther and Kaiser, who, you know, Kaiser gave this great, grand uh, entrance of Gunther. Gunther comes to the ring. He tries to smack the, the hat and wig off of our truth but it didn't come off immediately so he so he had to smack him again <laughs> it still didn't come off uh the two of them got into a bit of a tiff and a referee decided to ring the bell and they had a match in which our truth landed a couple of punches and some knee strikes before getting power bombed and pinned um uh, having gunter beat up uncle sam is a little on the nose uh, I'm not, I'm good with the foreign heel. Like, I love it. You know, I was, I made the video, what happened to the foreign heel? I'm okay with it. I just feel like they leaned into it. They, you had a more menacing foreign heel when he wasn't going and doing stuff like this. He was more menacing and more interesting when he was just vaguely ethnic and he wasn't American. He didn't speak the, the language. And everybody just look at him and tell that he's not American. But now if he's going to be like Ivan Drago and, you know, America sucks or something like that. Like, that's not going to be just a little too on the nose. You got to pull it back some, you know, like I know it was fun in the 80s. Oh, number one, two. But it's not the 80s anymore. You can't play it that way anymore. There's too many people out there who see that as a baby face thing. I'm telling you, it's it's a, this America's birthday, and not only did we have a mass shooting, which you know gave every all of the the whining leftists who hate America anyway, even though they claim they don't, it gave them all this ammunition to talk about how you know how they feel about Independence Day and the flags and all this kind of stuff. I think I, I think even Cage Size Seats tweeted out. When they did the, the vomiting spot with Otis, they tweeted out, uh, the 4th of July makes me sick too, or it makes me want to vomit too, or something like that. It was ridiculous. And you just be sitting here, you know, like, what? So, when you have the, the foreign heel, and I think I said this in that video, when people have decided that the foreign heel are the people within their own country, you know, it's the it's the patriots and the people who actually believe in God and country. You're the bad guys. You know, it's your fault that the that the mass shooting happened because they want to ban guns. You don't. So it's there. I mean, even though the Constitution, which is you know one of the founding documents of the United States, even though the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence were both, you know, about human liberty, and one of those human liberties is to be able to defend yourself with any weapon you deem you know necessary. Oh no, you can't have those rights. We've decided we, we don't we don't like those rights. You know, so you're the bad guy now. So when Americans are the bad guy, what the fuck is the foreign heel? He's he must be the good guy. So if that's the case, I even saw some of them say, Well, you know, is this supposed to make me not cheer for Gunther? I'm still gonna cheer for him. 
And I'm just kind of like, well, that's part of that is going to be, you know, you just a mark for him from when he was in Europe or whatever. So, and you know how awesome he is. That's true. Okay. I'll give you that. But then there's that latent dislike of patriotism and a, a blatant dislike of America. And when you, on a day like today, it seemed like a good day to do the whole, we're going to have Gunther kill Uncle Sam. But it's a little on the nose because, you know, now it's coming across, coming across a little propagandistic, you know, it's a little, it's a little too heavy, you know, he, I don't think we needed this. I don't think we needed it. You know, you know, I think maybe Gunter invading raw is fine. You know, maybe him confronting our truth is fine. He didn't say anything negative about the United States, but the, but the symbolism was there, you know, this big, vaguely Eastern European guy who they say have a, who has a, they have claimed has a Nazi first name because you can't possibly be named Gunther and not be named a Nazi because, you know, common fucking sense. It's a common name in, in that area. I'm pretty sure you can Google how many people named Gunther and it's probably fucking 5 million or some crazy number like that. But apparently it's a Nazi name. So whatever. And this guy with the crew cut and the, the iron jaw is going to come in and beat up the guy dressed like Uncle Sam. And he's a black guy. Like, yeah, you're you're hitting that you're hitting that nail a little too hard. All right. You know, you're, you're hitting it a little too hard. They should have gone a different route with it instead of going. Gunther is going to beat up. Our truth because he's dressed like Uncle Sam. I don't know. Maybe we go into the the mat is sacred. This foolishness has no business in the in the ring, and that's the direction we go in. Because that's that's Gunther's character before they decided he was vaguely ethnic European Ivan Drago. Before they decided to go that route with it, which I think is actually a diminishing of the character. That's just not my opinion. I think he had more range as a guy who respects the ring and doesn't want any foolishness in it and he's tired of seeing of all this foolishness all this 24 7 crap now you got this guy in the ring dressed as uncle sam you know even if he was doing a boogaloo or whatever we just go just sick of it he's going he's going to handle it he's going to be proactive and see like you know why are you dressed like this like this is a wrestling ring this is for matches this is not for your goofy comedy and beat him up for that rather than the vaguely ethnic European guy beats up on the black dude dressed as Uncle Sam in an I hate America rage. You know, probably not the best idea. You know, probably not the best idea. You don't want it. You don't want it to come across as propaganda. You know, even if you're okay with it, you just don't want to make propaganda. And it's, I don't think it gets Gunter over either because it doesn't really get over who he is or what his character is. Again, it just diminishes him to vaguely ethnic European guy. We don't need to do that. He is a persona. He is a character. This who he is is what Imperium was. Imperium should still exist. You know, we shouldn't move. Like I know they probably figure it's more over this way because that's what the crowd was doing. They was just going with the crowd. The crowd is already chanting USA at them because you know Kaiser is speaking German on the microphone and all that kind of stuff. Um, but. You have to train the audience to, to ignore where he comes from and focus on his message instead of, you know, taking the low, like you can take the low hanging fruit, but you have to force them to reach up sometimes too, you know, because you're going to end up with this crazy political thing that they got going on here. And it doesn't need to be that way, but I'm okay with it either way. Cause I'm not offended that, you know, uncle Sam got power bombed and I'm not going to chant USA at Gunter. I just like the foreign heel because it's fucking fun. And, but Gunter is not that guy. You know, he's not the Iron Sheik or Nikolai Volkov or anything like that. You know, he's not Vladimir Kozlov. So we shouldn't be trying to just do the same thing with him that we did with them. That, and that's my point. But, uh, that happened. It was a thing that occurred on this wrestling show. All right. Uh, Becky Lynch. She was very upset. She said she was mad as hell 
and that everything has gone wrong for her since Asuka appeared. And that uh, now she's going to meet no hose bar Becky. And Asuka interrupted Alexa Bliss promo because Alexa Bliss was saying that uh, she was very happy for her friend Liv Morgan. But then she said that she didn't have any friends. And that, you know, she realizes after watching Liv win that she needs to carry something other than Lily. And then Asuka interrupted Alexa Bliss by saying that uh, she's going to be the Raw Women's Champion because of Becky Lynch is not ready for Asuka or something to that effect. So then they had the match, which is the main event of the show, Becky Lynch versus Asuka, no holds barred. Uh, the finish came with Becky Lynch using the manhandle slam from the second rope through the table on Asuka. It was a pretty good finish, badass finish. The match itself was not terrible. You know, it was a fun match. It gave, it gave them a lot of time. Uh, Asuka crashed Becky Lynch through the barricade with her butt, which seems very unrealistic. Like, I don't think Asuka weighs that much. I don't think Asuka weighs 150 pounds. She probably weighs like 140 pounds. She's she's less chubby than she used to be. I have a hard time believing that if Asuka ran full speed and jumped into you with her butt, that you would go through a barricade. I have a hard time buying that. But it's a spot to happen. Uh, Becky Lynch did an explosion suplex um, on a stack of chairs outside the ring, which is a pretty good spot. Uh, Asuka responded with a superplex onto a stack of chairs. Uh, one of the better spots in the match was Oscar retrieved Kyrie's Kyrie Sane's umbrella, and she's going to use it as a weapon. Becky picked up the umbrella and blocked the green mist, which I thought was great. She still got covered in green mist, but at least it didn't get in her eyes. So, <laughs> so Becky Lynch and Oscar's their their feud is over. Um, it was great. They has they had nothing but good matches together. I'm guessing they want to going to pivot Oscar to uh, Alexa Bliss now because she interrupted Alexa Bliss when Alexa Bliss was talking about running for the title. So that means Becky Lynch is going to be moving forward. Hopefully this doesn't mean we're going to have Becky Lynch versus Bianca Belair. Uh, we need to put another roadblock in Becky Lynch's way. I don't know who that would be, though. Um, maybe that would be Alexa Bliss. Um, but I know on Twitter... I think WWE is teasing an Alexa Bliss, Liv Morgan feud. I think that's what they're teasing. But we know that um, there, there's chitter chatter that Charlotte and Bailey is on their way back. Um, then there's also still Ronda Rousey is there. So the SmackDown women's title scene is going to be a little bit crowded. Maybe they'll do something slick like move Charlotte to Raw uh, and have, you know, Bianca and Charlotte. Maybe not at uh, SummerSlam, but at a close, another event. It's been a while, you know. And I think having Becky, um, well, Charlotte versus Bianca, which is, I think she hasn't beaten Charlotte yet. So that could be, or maybe they can move Bailey to Raw, you know, however that would go. But it's, uh, it's, look, it's looking not too bad in terms of the deepness of the women's division if Bailey and Charlotte end up coming back. It will be incredibly lopsided because they both be back on SmackDown, which means that Raw needs some talent because uh, once Bianca is wrestling Carmella, that's going to kill her heat. That's not going to work. Carmella just is not a threat. Nobody considers Carmella to be a threat. She's going to need like a heavy or something. She's going to need somebody big, a bigger girl to be with her, you know, um, or something. And even when Zelina comes back, Zelina is small. So that's not going to really work out. I don't know what they're going to do on Raw because Bianca is very dominant. And the only person who could really challenge her physically is Dewdrop. And they've beaten Dewdrop like a fucking drum over the past year. So who knows? But um, I don't mind what I'm seeing here from the the women's division. Liv uh, being champion. Everybody is so skittish and scared that Liv is only going to be champion for a short amount of time. But... I'm telling you, when you're a, a white meat baby face like Liv, you're not supposed to be champion for a long time. That's how you lose sympathy. The longer you're the champion, the more sympathy you lose. Because now you're no longer the underdog. You're the champion. You have to switch. You have to pivot from that point. And that's really where so many of them failed. That's why WWE kept giving Daniel Bryan the title for short runs and snatching it back. Is because they know what his drawing power was. It was in him. It was in the chase. 
That's where the money was. The money was in the chase. And this is not some uh, new phenomenon. This is how wrestling works. You know, <clears throat> this is how the territory errors worked. The baby, the top baby face was an underdog most of the time, or he was just a top guy. He maybe won most of his matches, but he was an underdog in a match against a champion, or he might even been the favorite in a match against the champion, but the champion always escapes. He always gets away. And then finally the guy gets the win and then, but his title run is short. It's, it doesn't last very long. Dusty Rose was never champion for a long time. So what would you would do theoretically is you would, close the loophole on one you will give them finally give them the belt and then you find some way to screw them out of the belt in a short run you know and i'm talking a couple of weeks so i wouldn't be surprised if at SummerSlam we don't have Liv lose the title you know or you know if she doesn't lose the belt at SummerSlam, i'd be surprised i i expect Liv to lose the title because she's a white meat baby face underdog whose only character is, it's my dream, it's my dream. She has to do something else. If there's no plan B, why does she need to be the champion? She needs another hill to climb at that point. If she's going to be that, you know, I lived my dream, yada, yada, yada. She's got to, they did it with Rey Mysterio as well. You know, Rey Mysterio was a guy, you know, undersized, underdog, whatever. That's why they booked him like shit when he was the world champion. Because it doesn't fit his character to become a world beater all of a sudden. You don't, be five foot eight, five foot four or whatever. And you go from being a cruiserweight guy who could barely beat cruiserweights to being fucking Hulk Hogan who could slam giants and beat them in, you know, 20 minute matches. It doesn't make any fucking sense. So they're not going to book Liv Morgan like that. She's not going to become automatically a world beater, but she's going to walk all over the, the Natalia's. She can beat Natalia all day. She's probably going to beat Shayna Baszler too. Those are probably going to be maybe the only two opponents she really beats clean. I'd be surprised if she even gets a win over somebody like Bailey or Charlotte, let alone beating them clean. The the key to keeping Liv Morgan over isn't just giving her the title to satiate her fans. Now you validated her fans and her fandom, but now you have to screw her out of the belt. She has to lose the belt. And that's why she never should have won the belt in Money in the Bank anyway. Because that shit all over, you know, she shouldn't have done that. But they did it. It's what we're stuck with now. So now what they got to do is they got to engineer some way of getting the belt off live. And a lot, a lot of people are going to be very upset about it, but this is the way it works. All right. Um, just like in Super Mario, you get to the end of the stage. You think you saved Princess Peach and she gets snatched and, you know, with that Donkey Kong, she gets snatched and she gets taken away. It's the tease. Okay. You give and live the belt. Now you get the belt from her. And now Liv has to start all over again. And if the fans stay with her, she'll be able to get it back. And then you take it away again. Each time she just finds new challenges, new heels to climb. And you keep, she keeps getting there, but you keep kicking her back down. That keeps the, the story going. And eventually you'll get a, you know, she'll have a nice little run if you do that. And it makes sense. Sometimes it may take her a little bit longer to get there different twists, different turns, money in the bank this time. Maybe next time she doesn't need money in the bank. Maybe she wins the Royal Rumble. Maybe it could be anything. A triple threat match, a fatal four. Or maybe she beats somebody she's never beaten before. Maybe, you know, she uh, becomes so good she can pin Charlotte or Ronda Rousey straight up in a match without cheating. And that gets her into the title match and she wins the belt that way. You can improve her character while not giving her a long run with the title. Because if you give her a Hulk Hogan fucking run, it doesn't make sense. It doesn't match what she's been doing up to that point. You know, it's not like she all of a sudden she becomes the champion. She can beat everybody, you know? So you screw her out of the belt. Maybe somebody pulls the tights, you know, which was the problem with, with Nikki. And I know I saw so many people um, compare Liv Morgan to Nikki. The problem with Nikki is they didn't believe in Nikki. She, and Nikki wasn't over. You know, I, I keep saying that Nikki was not over. Live is over. So you have the opportunity here where people will believe in her. And if you screw her in a way where you feel like she's got the boot on her neck, then you put her in a Becky Lynch position. Because Becky Lynch won the title a couple of times, but people still felt like she didn't get the run she deserved. Like there was a boot on her neck constantly holding her down. And then she finally was able to break through that. You need to do the same thing with Liv Morgan. 
You need to put a position where somebody feels like she's being perpetually fucked with. And that'll upset the fans and it will get people behind her and they'll get genuine sympathy. They may even start spazzing out. She needs to go to AEW so she can get a proper push. And then you get her back to where she was, back to the title, and then you push her back down. So I wouldn't be surprised at all if, if Liv Morgan lost maybe her first real contenders match or first real title match. It's kind of how it works. You know, some, some of the greatest ever were not champion that long. You know, it's just all about what you do after the title run. You know, what do you do? How are you going to position her? And who are you going to have her lose the belt to? And how are you she's going to lose it? If she's going to lose it clean by straight up submitting in the middle of the ring, which is something they love doing now. I can't believe they did that shit to Rhea Ripley and they did that shit to Nikki. Why would you do that? You're building a baby face here. They shouldn't be tapping out anyway. And then you just have them straight up give up and cough the belt up. That's bullshit. That's the kind of shit nobody wants to see. You know, that's the kind of shit that would piss people off and make them lose faith in her. You've got to maintain that faith because that's all she got now. Now, she's not a particularly good promo. She's not a particularly good wrestler. All she got is the goodwill of the audience. You can't fuck that up. So the best way to do is to have her get screwed. You know, maybe two people work together to fuck her out of the title or something like that. Something. But um, I wouldn't be surprised at all if Liv Morgan lost the title quickly. You know, it wouldn't be that big of a surprise to me. But let me know what you guys think. Like, share, and subscribe. I'll talk to you guys later. Happy birthday, America.